Let's pray, please. Father, thank you for giving us the words of eternal life, for breathing these things forth to us, that we might know Jesus as our living Lord and Savior. We pray that we would receive the truth of this passage and what this topic in Scripture teaches with faith and love, lay it up in our hearts and practice it in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 1. Just one more, one more week detour. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 5 is our scripture reading this morning. And we'll be walking through this text um, about halfway through the sermon, but it's a topical, biblical exposition of the doctrine of repentance, as it's one of the most neglected and yet one of the most needful things of our time. Mark chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, this is God's word. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea was going out to him and all the people of Jerusalem. And they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. May God bless the reading of his holy word. Over the past two Sunday mornings, we looked at Psalm 22 and its remarkable portrait of the heart of our Lord during those moments when he was nailed to the cross, when he was bearing our iniquities and bearing the just punishment of our sins from God's righteous and just wrath against us. Jesus and his works alone received by the sinner's empty hand of faith, simple belief, is the sole legal grounds upon which we're guaranteed eternal life in heavenly glory. Believing the gospel is the byproduct granted by God to the newly changed heart of man in the new birth. Many professing Christians today really have never asked themselves this all-important question. How did Adam's fall into sin affect me personally? What did it do to me? Often people will get a physical on a regular basis from their doctor, even when they feel fine. Or they'll get a checkup on a regular basis from their doctor when they feel fine. Why do people do that? Why do we do that? Because there are many very serious and often life-threatening illnesses which we don't even know we have, which we cannot detect. And this is the problem with man in his fallen condition. His spiritual death in Adam has rendered him unable to see, unable to hear the truth about what we really are, who we really are, and hence who Jesus is. The heart of man, namely his highest affection and love. That's what the Bible is talking about when it speaks of the heart of man. It means that one place that we love the most, the seat of our highest affection, the thing that means more to us than anything else, and there can always only be one of those. All people prior to being born again, are the dedicated servants of sin. The highest affection that man has, apart from being born again, is lust and sin. And what has to happen for this situation to be remedied? A person must be born again by God's Holy Spirit. Now, how can we know if we've been born again, and how can we know if someone else has been born again? And the answer is very simple. We will see the effects of that great work. The work itself is supernatural and is entirely invisible to us. But the results of that great regeneration, that new birth from on high upon the dead center, the results are clear, they're obvious, and they're unmistakable. People born again will repent. People who are born again will repent of their sin. And people who are born again will believe the gospel. I was asked this past week, how do you know? For sure. How do you know for sure that you really are a Christian? And my answer was real simple. Because at no point in my life have I ever thought, even for a nanosecond that I've ever detected, have I ever trusted in anything other than Jesus Christ to save me from going to hell. And I hate myself and I hate my sin. That's good enough. I trust in Christ alone. Well, what do you think yourself? How you doing spiritually? What do you like? Are you a pillar in a tower of godliness? Nope, never have been. I heard that great quotation. I shared it in my pastoral prayer with you, Horatius Bonar. 
give, a, give an account of my sins to God. I can't even give an account of my righteousness to God. Because even in all of that, if I sat and told you every good thing I've ever done in my Christian life, there's enough ill motives and sin in my righteousness to send me to hell. And so my confidence is in the righteousness of someone else, the obedience of someone else. And that's how I know I have eternal life. It's not arrogant. It's not arrogant. It's not presumptuous. It's simply having confidence in divine mercy and what we've been looking at in Psalm 22. People that are born again will repent. They will believe. Christ's work alone is received by God, our judge, as the full payment of our sins and the righteousness by which alone we are judged and declared righteous before God is the righteousness of Christ alone. And yet there's also repentance. Without repentance, a person would never believe the gospel. They would never see their need for it. Now what is repentance? What is that? It is a saving grace whereby a sinner, out of a true sense of his sin and understanding of the mercy of God in Christ, grieves over and hates his sin and thus turns from it to God with a full purpose in his heart of putting that sin behind him and following Jesus in obedience. That's what repentance is. If a person doesn't see their sin, if they don't grieve over their sin, if they don't hate their sin, as not merely dangerous in that it can send us to hell, not merely that, but that it's contrary to the character of the God I adore. It's contrary to him. I don't just hate sin and grieve over it because it might send me to hell. I hate it because it's contrary to the one I love now. It's contrary to Christ. If that hasn't happened in someone's heart, if they don't see that, then do they really believe in Jesus? Could they believe in him? In other words, without repentance, a person would never understand why they need saving in the first place. This is why the idea of an unrepentant Christian makes no sense at all. Vast multitudes of people in America have heard about Jesus and they think that they really do believe in him. But they've never felt convicted over their sin. They've never grieved over or hated their sin. They've never grieved over the weakness of their repentance. We have to repent of that too. Have you repented of how lame your repentance is? And then of how lame your repentance about how lame your repentance is? I mean, it just goes on forever. There is one and only one reason that people truly believe in Jesus to the saving of their soul. There's only one reason that they do. They are convinced by the Holy Spirit of their sinfulness. And they agree with what the Spirit says about themselves in Scripture. They agree, I am under God's eternal death sentence of going to hell, and it is righteous and it is just. Charles Spurgeon even said once, I got to the point as God was converting and saving him that I reacted with indignation of the idea that God would let me into heaven. It would be wrong for him to let me into heaven. It would be right for him to throw me off into hell. And so that's why people come to Christ. Repentance is God showing the newly regenerated person that they are indeed sinful and are under God's curse. It is what is behind a person believing the gospel. We believe the gospel because we grieve over and we hate our sin. And we see how evil we really are. And we see how deserving we are of hell. And we recognize and know, apart from that supernatural work of God, I wouldn't be sitting in church. I wouldn't have a Bible. I wouldn't care about anything like that. You say repentance is no soft option. It always goes with true faith in Jesus. And there's a lot of confusion about the scriptural teaching in this matter of repentance. Many falsely believe that looking at repentance is necessary. You're adding work to to the gospel. It's not. It's simply recognizing God doesn't merely justify his elect people. He also changes them completely. He changes their heart. Now, You've heard me emphasize many times. You know, I want you to understand why I emphasize this the way I do. Because I don't hear many others doing this. Okay, y'all ready? We're not saved by being new creatures. Everybody get, get that? You don't get into heaven because you're different now. That's not why you're welcomed into heaven. We're not saved by having a new heart. We're not saved by having desires that are holy. We don't get into heaven by any subjective fruit that we bear in our lives or progress that we make in our obedience or personal holiness. Just remember what the scriptures teach as it's summarized so well in the larger catechism. Question 73, how does faith justify a sinner in the sight of God? Listen, faith justifies a sinner in the sight of God, not because of those other graces which always accompany it, nor of good works that are the fruits of it, but only as it is an instrument by which he receives and applies Christ and his righteousness. An unrepentant Christian 
Impossible. Impossible. And thus, it is essential that we have a biblical understanding of the wonderful doctrine of repentance. A great theologian wrote this paragraph, quote, One of the divinely predicted characteristics of the perilous times in which we are now living is that evil men and imposters shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. 2 Timothy 3.13 the deeper reference of these words is to spiritual seducers and deceivers, men with captivating personalities, men who occupy a prominent place in Christendom, men with an apparently deep reverence for Holy Scripture, are beguiling souls with fatal error. Not only are evolutionists, higher critics, and modernists deluding multitudes of our young people with their sugar-coated lies, but some who pose as the champions of orthodoxy and boast of their ability to rightly divide the word of truth are poisoning the minds of many to their eternal destruction. Such a charge as we have just made is indeed a serious one, and one which is not to be readily received without proof, but proof is easily furnished. The word of God teaches plainly in this dispensation, equally with preceding ones, God requires a deep and sincere repentance before he pardons any sinner. Repentance is absolutely necessary, just as necessary as is faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish, Luke 13, 3. Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life, Acts eleven eighteen. 18. 2 Corinthians 7, 10, godly sorrow leads to repentance. It is impossible to frame language more explicit than that. Therefore, in view of these verses and other verses to be quoted, we cannot but sorrowfully regard those who are now affirming that repentance is not, in this dispensation, essential as being deceivers of souls, blind leaders of the blind. You ever watch Ray Comfort go out there and share the gospel with people on YouTube? You should go hear him. There are so many people, never been to church, they're living with someone out of wedlock, engaged in drug use, premarital sex, everything else. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, I walked an aisle. Yeah, I prayed the magic prayer 15 years ago. What was left out of what they were told? Repent. Apparently, they weren't told to do that. They weren't told that you got to turn away from your former life. You can't hold on to idols. You don't just add Jesus to the mix. He shatters everything. He destroys your whole life and sets you in a whole new direction. So I want to go over four things with you this morning. What is repentance? Then we're going to look at John the Baptist, who was the, the guy who plowed the road, shall we say, for the coming of the gospel. We're going to look at what repentance is not, and then we're going to look at what it is again. Now, where I used to live in Ohio, in Cincinnati, Ohio, Cincinnati, I'm allergic to the whole city. Uh, went there this past week to go see my parents. I just sneezed and sneezed and sneezed. I don't miss living. It's one of the mold ragweed capitals of the universe. And it's also, it's also the city of extremes. I always called it the city of extremes with weather because it gets above 96 in the summer and never comes down and it doesn't rain. And then you get, you get 25 inches of snow every, every summer. We once had a very long dry spell where we used to live and nearly everything in my backyard died. And the temperature was in the upper 90s for several weeks. It didn't rain at all for about a whole month. And large sections of my yard not only died, but because there were places that people walked, that my kids walked and played, they just turned into dirt. Now, eventually, when the weather sort of let up a little bit, I wanted to try to grow grass in some of those sections of the yard. And there was one section in particular right in front of the front porch that everyone would walk on to get in the backyard. And it was just, it had become complete dust. It looked like a desert. Now, I, I don't have a green thumb. I had one plant in my life growing up. I had a cactus that I got when I was about 14. And as soon as I went away to college, my mother quickly killed it. But I knew how to take care of that cactus. You know why I took such good care of it? It only needed to be watered once a month. And when, as soon as I went to college, my mom watered it every day. And I came home and it was brown. And she said, well, it looked, it looked so thirsty like it needed a drink. I said, mother, it's a cactus. You don't need to water it every day. But my point being, I don't know anything about how to plant or grow anything. So I just bought some grass seed, threw it on the dirt, put some fertilizer on it, and watered it. And nothing happened. Day after day, week after week, and it was driving me nuts. There's nothing happening on the ground. I even looked, got down on my hands and knees looking to see, has a single thing germinated on the dirt? Why, why would nothing grow? Because the ground was fallowed. When soil is neglected, it becomes fallow. If it's uncultivated, it's not ready for seed to be grown. Interestingly enough, this notion of fallow ground is often applied to people. 
in the Bible by God. God calls people fallow. Listen to Jeremiah 4, verse 3. For thus says the Lord to the men of Judah and Jerusalem, Break up your fallow ground, and do not sow among thorns. Circumcise yourselves to the Lord, and take away the foreskin of your hearts, you men of Judah, inhabitants of Jerusalem, lest my fury come forth like fire. Hosea 10, verse 12. Sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord. The prophets gave God's word to the people of Israel, and God told them, Break up your fallow ground, he said. What does that mean? It means their hearts were impervious to the seeds of the gospel because they were unrenewed and they were stone cold dead. Back to my, my backyard illustration. This is literally what happened. I remembered watching Little House on the Prairie when I was a kid. And I remember Charles Ingalls pulling a plow behind a beast of burden in his yard. That's, maybe that's why nothing will grow here. So I took a straight edge shovel and chopped up all that soil, threw some more seed down, some fertilizer, watered it, and whoosh, a lush, beautiful patch of grass began to grow. And it was, it was like hallowed ground in my backyard. No one was allowed to walk on it or anything. It was my special triumph. But that was the problem. The ground was all crusted over, it was hardened. But once it was chopped up, Everything could grow just fine. And that's the way human hearts are. Do you see how dependent we are on God? Who's the only one that can plow the ground? The Holy Spirit alone can do it. That's why we ask him to do that. The prophets gave these words to the people. Plow up your fallowed ground. The plow, that's been the basic instrument for most of recorded history. For the initial cultivation of soil and preparation for sowing seed and planting. Even today where you see agriculture done on a massive scale, these giant machines, they all have the same concept. They're all doing the same thing. From the lowly donkey to the huge industrial agricultural equipment, they're all doing the same thing. They're all trying to do this. Here's the technical definition. The, The agricultural definition of plowing, quote, to turn over the upper layer of the soil, bringing fresh nutrients to the surface, which, while burying weeds, the remains of previous crops, and both crop and weed seeds, allowing them to break down. It also aerates the soil, allows it to hold moisture better, and provides a seed-free medium for planting an alternate crop, end quote. Repentance is God's plow that makes the heart of man ready to receive the seeds of the gospel. And apart from him doing that, the gospel doesn't have anywhere. It's like me trying to plant grass in my backyard on that hard, crusted over soil. It's not going to work if the plow doesn't come. So I want you to think of repentance. Think of repentance and saving faith as two sides of a coin. Repentance is the turning away of the sinner from his old way of life because he now hates that old way of life. It's him turning away from sin because he hates that sin now and he's turning toward God. He turns away from his attachment to and his enslavement to sin, from his love for sin and self and turns away from it to Christ. So saving faith is that turning toward Jesus as one's new master, relying upon his person and work, his righteousness and his satisfaction of justice at the cross alone as the basis of getting into heaven of one's justification before God. There can be no saving faith without repentance, and there's no repentance that is not accompanied by saving faith in Jesus. The two things always go together. You can never just have one of them. And that's why those poor people, those poor deluded souls that you see on YouTube being witnessed to, do you know what God did to remedy the situation? Yeah, he sent his son into the world. I I believe all that. But you live with your girlfriend out of wedlock? Yeah. And you're, you're doing drugs? Yeah. You ever go to church? Nah, not interested. They weren't told about what is essential. They weren't told the truth. Those two things always go together, and yet it is essential to distinguish them from one another. You cannot mix or mingle repentance and faith. They are distinct graces of God. Faith in Jesus always is only relying on Jesus to get into heaven. That is always what faith is, and that is only what faith is. Faith is not obedience. Faith is not obedience to the law. It is not that in any way, shape, or form. Faith is not repentance either. It is merely and only and always confidence and divine mercy which saves us and justifies us on the basis of the work of Christ in our place. People will say then, but isn't repentance necessary? And the answer is, as a fruit and evidence that we're born again, yes. But we do not rest in or rely upon our repentance or fruit or works or holiness 
or anything done in us or done by us to get us into heaven at the final day of judgment. Uh, just for the record, since this is the, the new false gospel of our time, there is no eschatological final day of judgment confirmation of the reality of our faith by good works. That's a lie. That's not the truth. There is no confirmation of the reality of our faith by our works on the day of judgment. You know why I know that? Because it's not found anywhere in scripture. Number two, why would God, who is all-knowing, need to confirm anything? He knows if your faith's real, okay? He doesn't need to confirm it by your works. Those works and those fruits will be born by God's Spirit. They don't get us into heaven in any way at all. Westminster Shorter Catechism, question 85. What does God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse due to us for sin? To escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires of us faith in Jesus Christ, repentance unto life, with the diligent use of all the outward means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption. In other words, you're going to be part of a church too. You're going to be under the preaching of the word. You're going to take the Lord's Supper. You're going to be baptized before the people of God. Now, the very first words that are recorded off the lips of Jesus, in the very chapter that we read from, Mark chapter 1, the first thing Jesus said in his public ministry in Mark's gospel is, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. Repent and believe in the gospel. And notice the rest of scripture, just a few more passages, Luke 13, 3, already quoted it for you. Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus told that to those Jews that, that were complaining to him about the men that were killed by Pilate and the, the eight, and Jesus br brings up the 18 men upon whom that tower in Siloam fell. We don't look at that and say, well, man, they must have been really bad. Jesus says, you're no better than they were. You guys think that tower fell, fell on them because they were worse than you? Not at all. But unless you repent, a tower might fall on you tomorrow or the next day. God is not, his arm is long enough to reach everywhere. Remember when that tsunami happened in 2004? Remember all the videos that came in and everyone's phones are pointed out? You see those walls of water just washing over people and it killed, what, 250,000 people? Remember watching those from in Ohio, where I lived in Ohio? And my kids thought, boy, I sure am glad we live somewhere where God can't do things like that to us. <laughs> uh, think again. Uh, he can, we could be upon a fault line right here. Um, and before the sermon's over, we're all dead. So repent right now, please. And believe in Jesus now. We might not make it. Acts eleven eighteen. 18, after seeing the Gentiles, Cornelius speak in tongues and receive the Holy Spirit, the scripture says, when they heard these things, they became silent. They glorified God, saying, God has granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. In 2 Corinthians 7, 10, Paul describes real repentance. He contrasts godly sorrow with worldly sorrow. Worldly sorrow is... Yeah, I shouldn't have done that. It really messed up my life. Godly sorrow is, I shouldn't have done that. It's an offense to my God. It's what David wrote in Psalm 51. Against you and you only have I sinned. Now, did he sin against Bathsheba? Yes. Against Uriah? Yes. Against, against the whole country? Yes. But what does he see first and foremost? What's the real source of his hatred, his heartache, and his grief over his sin? I've sinned against God who created me and redeemed me and has done so much for me in my life and is so worthy of my obedience. I have sinned against him. Godly sorrow leads to repentance leading to salvation. Paul on Mars Hill there in Acts 17, Acts 17, 30. These times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent. Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way. Let the wicked forsake the way he lives his life and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. And to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. When the crowd at Jerusalem there in Pentecost was pricked to the heart, they asked Peter, what shall we do? And he said, repent. Repent and be baptized. Okay, if you still have your Bible open to Mark chapter 1, let's look at the first few verses here. Look at Mark 1, 1 through 5 again. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way? The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Make ready the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, and all the country of Judea was going out to him, and all the people of Jerusalem, and they were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. They were speaking their sins and being baptized there in the Jordan River. Now the wilderness of Judea, where John suddenly bursts onto the scene here, he's the final Old Testament prophet, 
is the way it's described in textbooks, quote, the rolling badlands between the hill country of Judea to the west and the Dead Sea and lower Jordan to the east, stretching northward to about the point where the Jabbok flows into the Jordan. It is indeed a desolation, a vast expanse of barren, chalky soil covered with pebbles, broken stones, and rocks, end quote. This wilderness was surrounded by towns that were filled with people. And John's message was anything but flowery and complicated. Uh, John the Baptist is one of the most fascinating people. He's also one of the clearest preachers ever, ever. When I was in seminary, I took a class called The Church and the World in the 20th Century. We had to read all these, all these 20th century, these theologians in the 1900s like Karl Barth and Paul Tillich and all these other people and thought, you know, give me John the Baptist, give me Romans 8 over this stuff any day. How could anyone understand what these guys are even talking about? you got to love John the Baptist breaking through the fallowed ground to make it real clear to everybody. It was very distinct. It was a very distinct Jewish context that he was speaking to. Listen to the, these four things about the, con the context in which John preached was this. The Pharisees had all but destroyed the biblical text by burying it under layer after layer of rabbinic traditions. Their traditions had nullified the word of God everywhere. Secondly, you have the Sadducees who reject the supernatural elements of Scripture. Isn't it interesting? We have all the same groups we have today. You have the legalistic conservatives, that's the Pharisees. You have the flaming liberals, that's the Sadducees. And then you have the dominant messianic expectation of the time that he would be a temporal deliverer from political oppression and we all need to go to war. That's the, the radical crazy people. And then you have, fourthly, the Jewish people. They believed in and they taught justification by works of obedience to God's law, assisted by God's grace. That was their false message. And lo and behold, many groups teach the same thing today. How do you get to heaven? Couldn't do it without God's grace. Couldn't do it without his help. But the decisive factor is what you do in your works. And over against that, the Bible thunders. God thunders. No, you can't contribute anything to it at all. John's message can be summarized in one word, repent. In the original, the word that's used there, repent, metanoia, means a radical change of mind and heart that leads to a complete turnabout of life, a call to turn away from sin, from idolatry, from false teachings. Remember, our confession describes repentance unto life as an evangelical grace. Plowing the conscience to be ready to receive the gospel seeds of Jesus is what John's entire existence was about. And so John the Baptist really is the plow. He is the straight-edge shovel. He is Charles Ingalls' plow being pulled over the desert. The consciences of men are, as it were, fallow ground. They're hardened by sin and unbelief. And the farmer could scatter seed in such a field, but none of the seeds would germinate. None of them would take root or grow or yield fruit. And there's nothing anyone can do to plow the fallow ground of their conscience. The ground is stony. It's hard. It's sun-baked. Everything in it's dead. There's spiritual blindness and there's spiritual deafness. Indeed, there's hostility. There's hatred towards everything that is righteous and true. And I would ask you, haven't you shared the gospel with someone like that before? Someone whose ground is completely fallow. And you speak about the law of God and the condemnation for sin. And you speak of those things and they don't tremble. You speak of those things, you speak of the cross and there's no response. You speak to them of the coming judgment, there's no effect. Paul said in Romans 3.18, describing the state of unregenerate sinful man, there is no fear of God before their eyes. They're not scared to die. They don't care. And I say to you, you who were born and raised in the bosom of a Bible-believing, gospel-preaching church, you who, as you sit here, could defeat 98% of the earth's population in Bible trivia. You who have named Christ before the elders, before the church, at prayer meetings, at Bible studies, have you experienced that radical change of mind and heart that leads to a complete turnabout of life? Now, you may, by God's grace alone, not remember when you were hardened in sin because God saved you and granted you repentance and faith when you were very young. Whatever the case may be, do you see your sin with revulsion? And do you have an intense desire to discard it? Are you too busy noticing and discussing the faults of others to notice the logs, the, the entire forest hanging out of our own eyes? We all have so much sin, so many logs in our eyes, so much that is wrong with us. We should always be much more troubled by our own sinfulness than we are by the sinfulness of others. Do you remember what the finger of God wrote on the wall at Belshazzar's party? Remember that? The finger of God wrote mene, mene, tekel, upharsin. One of those terms means you have been weighed, you have been measured, and you have been found wanting. That's God's indictment against all of us. 
Mene, mene, tekao ufarsan. You've been weighed and measured and found definitely wanting. The trial's already happened. The verdict is in. Galatians 3.22, the scripture is shut up. Everyone under sin. Romans 3.19, we know whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world become guilty before God. We are criminals under a death sentence. And all that needs to happen is for us to miss a few heartbeats that will usher us into eternity. And so I ask, do you know true repentance? Do you know the Lord Jesus as the one you follow? The one you long to worship and obey? Your master, your savior, the one who died for you gladly, laid down his life for you? Do you know him as the one who died on the cross specifically for you and your transgressions, your sins? You know, one of the best ways to help us understand what something is is to contrast it to what it's not. I want to tell you four things repentance is not. Four things that repentance is not. Number one, it is not trembling under the preaching of God's word. Many a man or woman once moved to tears by preaching are now in hell. Felix, remember Felix from Acts 24? He was terrified by Paul's preaching. It really bothered him. As he discoursed about righteousness and self-control and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. He was terrified. But he told Paul, go away for now. I'll call you later when I've got time. Go away. So it's not trembling under the preaching of God's word. Number two, repentance is not being almost persuaded to become a Christian. Almost persuaded. Agrippa, in Acts 26, 28, Agrippa was almost persuaded by Paul to become a Christian. The great Augustine knew that Christianity was true for about a year before he was baptized. He knew it was true for a year before he finally said, all right, let's do this. Many receive the word with joy, but are soon to be seen to be stony, stony ground hearers. Even Pharaoh himself was willing to admit, I have sinned against the Lord your God, he said. People may come to that realization that they ought to yield to God, and they may even confess their sins. They may even confess the faith to be true. But the almost Christian is just as condemned as the Satanist high priest. So being almost persuaded is not repentance. Thirdly, repentance is not humbling yourself under sin. When the servant of God met and rebuked King Ahab for stealing Naboth's vineyard, and having Naboth murdered, we're told in 1 Kings 21, 27, he tore his clothes and put sackcloth on his body and fasted and lay in sackcloth and went about mourning. Yet in the very next chapter of 1 Kings, Ahab rebels against God again. Oh sure, we'll reform our lives from time to time, turn over a new leaf, but remain firmly attached to our lusts. Remember Herod? Remember Herod, he had John the Baptist put in prison, the guy we just read about. But he wouldn't let Herodias kill him. Why? What difference did it make? He was still attached to sin. He's just trying to turn the volume down on his conscience just a little bit. Fourthly, repentance is not confessing sin, necessarily. This may be one way that repentance manifests itself, but remember Judas Iscariot. Judas said, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Is that real God-given repentance? No, it was not. True repentance is a holy hatred and horror of sin itself. Please make that distinction in your reasoning. Dear congregation, listen. It is a holy hatred and horror of sin, not just sin's punishment. It's a hatred of sin itself as being contrary to God, not just a hatred or fear of hell. Now let's look at what it is in closing. Repentance is a grace given by God to a sinner whereby out of a sight and sense of not only of the danger but also of the filthiness of his sins is contrary to the holy nature and righteous law of God and upon understanding the mercy of God in Christ, they grieve for and hate their sin so as to turn from them to God, purposing and endeavoring to walk with him in all the ways of his commandments. So grieving and hatred. You want to understand what is repentance? It's grieving and hating, grieving over and hating your sin. Grieving over and hating your sin, not coddling it, not protecting it, not having, I'm going to reserve one little space to hold on to this sin that I'm really into. It's not that. Listen to Paul's description of the new life of believers, Romans 6.1. 
What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? He said in Romans 5.20, where sin abounds, grace abounds all the more. It's a seemingly dangerous thing to say, isn't it? And Paul's answer to the charge, Paul, you're telling people they can just sin all they want and still go to heaven. And Paul's point is, that is impossible. May it never be. How shall we who died to sin live in it any longer? And then he says in in verse 6, knowing this, in the indicative mood, our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we would no longer be slaves of sin. Where true repentance exists, there has been a liberation of enslavement to sin, not, not the presence of sin. Sin is still very much there, as you all know if you're a Christian, but we're not enslaved to it anymore. The old man has died, and the new man is emerging. And we have to learn as we live our Christian lives how to put off the old man more and more, how to put on the new more and more, as Paul describes in Ephesians 4. And thus, all believers exclaim with every fiber of their soul, Romans 7, 15, what I am doing, I do not understand. Have you thought that this past week? What I'm doing, I don't understand it. For what I will to do, that I do not practice, but what I hate, that I do. It's not merely that I'm I'm willing to admit I'm a sinner, not merely that I'm willing to confess my sin, not merely that I fear eternal damnation and punishment, but there is now the positive existence of real hatred of sin and a real love, even if it's very small and faint by your own estimation, of Christ. That which was once my master and my first love, my sin, has become my mortal enemy. So I would ask, do we hate our sin because it is sin? Do we hate our sin because it's contrary to the character of God? Now, does hearing all of this and hearing this sermon, does it make you nervous that perhaps your hatred of sin is not strong enough? That's not a bad sign. That's a good sign. That's a really good thing. Hating how weak our repentance is, is itself a sign that we're converted. Being dissatisfied with how hard we fight against our sin, that's what Jesus means when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit. The day you become, in your own estimation, rich in spirit, and I'm doing great, that's the day I would, as a pastor, start worrying about you. The person who comes to me, so, are you happy with your prayer life? Yeah, it's awesome. Are you happy with your present level of holiness? Yep, defeating everything, walking on high, victorious Christian life. If he's married, I'm going to say, okay, I need to get your wife in here. I wonder if she thinks you're walking on high. If she thinks you live the victorious Christian life. 2 Corinthians 8, 9 says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. But we have to esteem ourselves as poor first before we can be made rich by Christ. If you're a Christian, I want to say to you, I, I've, got, I've got good news. And that's the gospel, and Jesus has done it all. All to him we owe. Sin hath left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. But here, here's the bad news. You will never be satisfied with your repentance. Okay? So just chalk that one up. You will never be satisfied with how well you're doing with that. You will never be satisfied with the strength of your faith either. And people ask me the question, how much faith do you have to have in Jesus? And the response is, any. Any. It can be a mustard seed. It can be the size of a mountain. Any at all. Because you're not saved by your faith. You're saved by the object your faith rests in, Christ. And thankfully, we're not saved by either our repentance or our faith. We're saved by the one in whom our faith rests, Christ. And that's why we have certainty. That's why we have assurance. The apostolic call to turn in faith toward Jesus Christ, it always implied a turning away from sin. And that turning away from sin is a lifelong process that will not be completed until death. You know, that was the very first thesis thesis in the 95 Theses of Luther. Repentance is a way of life, he said. It's not something you just do once in a while. You don't do penance. It's, it's a whole attitude towards your life. You're always repenting. That turning away from sin plays no role whatsoever in gaining heaven for us. Paul told the Thessalonians, he reminded them of their conversion. 1 Thessalonians 1.9, you turned from idols to serve the living and true God. He was describing that break with sin, that break with their idolatrous past. So I want to say, repentance is no easy business. You all know I've recommended the book, Thomas Brooks' book, Precious Remedies Against Satan's Devices. It's a classic. It's wonderful. Under devices that Satan uses to draw the soul to sin, device number six, listen to this. Satan persuades the soul that the work of repentance is an easy work. 
and that therefore the soul need not make such a matter of sin. Why, suppose you do sin, says the devil. It's no such difficult thing to return, confess, and be sorrowful, and beg pardon, and cry, Lord, have mercy upon me. And if you do this, God will cut the, the score, and quote, and pardon your sins and save your souls. The first remedy, says Brooks, the first remedy is seriously to consider that repentance is a mighty work, a difficult work, a work that is above our power. There is no power below that power below that power that raised Christ from the dead and that made the world that can break the heart of a sinner and turn the heart of the sinner. And listen to this next quote, the line from Brooks. Thou art as well able to melt diamonds as to melt thine own heart. To turn a rock into flesh as to turn thine own heart to the Lord. To raise the dead and to make a world as to repent. And then he says this, one of the greatest quotations I've ever read in all my theological studies over the years. He says, repentance is a flower that grows not in nature's garden. It only comes from God on high. And then he quotes Jeremiah 13, 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots? Then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil. Repentance is a gift that comes down from above. Men are not born with repentance in their hearts as they are born with tongues in their mouths, end quote. Repentance, we can't do it. We can't do it. Only God can grant it to us. It's an evangelical grace. Acts 5.31, him God has exalted to his right hand to be prince and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Acts 11.18, when they heard these things, they became silent and they glorified God saying, then God has granted to the Gentiles repentance unto life. You see that? Granted to the Gentiles. Paul in describing false teachers in 2 Timothy chapter 2, in humility, he tells Timothy, correcting those who are in opposition if God perhaps will grant them repentance that they may know the truth. Ezekiel 11.19, then I will give them one heart. I will put a new spirit within them and take the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. Remember Jesus' own words, those immortal words, those glorious words, John 3, 7. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who was born of the Spirit. And this is why every gospel preacher, every Christian layperson who has unsaved family and friends must go to their knees and pray. Because man's problem has never been that he's just not sufficiently interested. It's not that he just doesn't care that much. It's that all men need God to intervene for God the Holy Spirit to exert the very same power upon the blind, dead sinner that was ex exercised upon the lifeless body of Jesus in the tomb when he was raised back to life. And that's what Paul says in Ephesians 1. We've been enlightened, our minds have been enlightened in the knowledge of God that the very same power that raised Christ from the dead was exerted on us when we were born again. The motive to repent by John the Baptist, he says, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's very important. He says, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In other words, the king you serve now, self and sin and lust and pride and envy and anger and everything else, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. You want to have God for your king, and that requires that you turn away from your former master. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The great theologian Charles Hodge wrote, Every believer receives Christ as his king. Those who receive him in sincerity constitute his kingdom in the sense in which the loyal subjects of an earthly sovereign constitute his kingdom. Those who profess allegiance to Christ as king constitute his visible kingdom on earth. It is said to consist in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Romans 14, 17, that's the end of the Charles Hodge quotation. It was the kingdom of God that Jesus brought. And those that are the faithful subjects of that kingdom have repented of their loyalty to their former king, sin and self. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. The kingdom in which all the subjects are protected by the mercy and grace of God and all are brought into heaven when they die. That's the kingdom you want to be a part of. Because to be a part of any other kingdom will take you to hell. John the Baptist's message to the world is the same as the message of all Old Testament prophets. It's the same as the message of Jesus himself. Turn away from rebellion and return to God. Repent of your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. To experience true repentance We've got to come to grips with the justice of God in pronouncing us guilty and sinful. Until we agree and are at least to some degree in our hearts troubled by that, we're not going to believe in Jesus. 
You know, there's a beautiful portrait of repentance and faith given to us while Jesus was on the cross. You know the story. Listen, Luke 23, 36. The soldiers also mocked him and coming and offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And the inscription was also written over him in letters of Greek, Latin, and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the other, the other guy, crucified on the other side of Jesus, rebuked him. Rebuked that guy. Imagine being nailed to a cross and rebuking someone else. He says, do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? And here's his repentance, listen. And we indeed justly. We indeed justly. For we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. You see his repentance manifested there? What's happening to us here? We're nailed to this cross. It's righteous. It is just in the sight of God for us to be here. And then he, he turns after he repents of his sin. He sees his life of sin, that he ruined his whole life in those final moments. Then he has his faith in Christ alone. I love the, the expression of it. Lord, remember me. After he rebukes that other guy, don't you have any fear of God? We're about to die. You don't care? What does Romans 3.18 say? There's no fear of God before their eyes. That guy had no fear of God. But suddenly something happens in this, this man's heart. He's born again by the Holy Spirit. That stony heart, it begins to beat with the life of God in those final moments of his existence. And he says, we're up here and it's right that we're here. We're nailed to these crosses. It's just. We're receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man's done nothing wrong. Then he, he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Didn't have a whole lot of time to consecrate his life to do good works, to bear fruit. What did it take? Repentance on any level. Faith in Jesus. He looked to Jesus. He was saved. And Jesus gave him that blessed assurance. Today, you'll be with me in paradise. So I want to ask myself and ask all of us, has the, the plow cut through the fallow ground in our heart so that the gospel seed can take root? When you consider God's indictment and the punishment thereof, do you heartily endorse and agree with that? You read those horrifying descriptions of hell and you think, yes, that's what I deserve. You don't think, man, that seems pretty harsh. Is that really what I deserve? You think that is exactly what I deserve. It's exactly what I deserve. Is your hope of going to heaven at the moment of death in Jesus alone, nothing else? Are you too overwhelmed with the evil in your own heart that you don't have time to neatly catalog the faults and sins of others? Paul told those pagan Athenians there who worshiped gods and temples all around him, truly these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he's appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Christians believe upon Jesus alone for their salvation because they grieve over and hate their sin. That's what repentance is. Without repentance, there can be no faith in Jesus Christ, no real faith in him. And so remember, the very same God who redeems us from all our lawless deeds also makes us zealous for good works. Let's remember that. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we bless your name for granting us these saving graces, repentance unto life, a holy revulsion and hatred towards our sin, and then a simple faith and trust in Jesus Christ, our new master. We're grieved every moment of our existence that we don't follow him better and that we don't repent with more sincerity, that our tears don't flow more often over how sinful we are and how great your love is. Help us remember, we, like everyone else, before you made us born again and granted us salvation, we were, like everyone else, children of wrath. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even while we were dead in our transgressions and sins, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, we have been saved. May that be the theme of our heart. May our eyes stay fixed upon the cross always as our only hope of salvation. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing our closing hymn, How Great Thou Art. Mm -hmm.